It's a way of uh, trying to put control of how the network gets configured in some sense into the hands of programmers rather than just leaving it to a bunch of network protocols. I've talked in the past a bit about IP routing uh, and you've got the idea there that there's routers which are computers that have multiple network cards in that are interconnected and they run some software on the routers and the software implements a particular routing protocol, a uh, link state protocol or whatever it might be. And so the, the software on the routers exchanges packets with other instances of that software and they work out the state of the network and they figure out how everything's laid out and they work out how to route through that network and then when data comes in, other packets come into the network, all the routers know what to do. They look at the packet's destination address, they work out where to send it so it gets towards its destination. So that's kind of traditional networking. With software-defined networking, the approach is basically is essentially saying that you want to go from that quite distributed uh, control where you configure things, but then the protocols just run in the background and work out what's going on, to a much more sort of centralized control. So you have software running, which is going to actually tell all of the routers or switches, typically. It's usually done at the lower layer thing, so it's usually done at an Ethernet layer rather than at an IP layer. They tell the switches, OK, when you see this, thing, this packet come in, you should do this with it. And so it's much more direct, kind of poking everything into the network, poking all the rules in and saying what should happen. If you've got a sort of a traditional network, you might have a bunch of uh, switches or routers, whatever you want to call them. Let's take the case of Ethernet spanning tree. There's a protocol running called spanning tree, which designates that this is going to be the root switch in the network. And then that runs a protocol to work out a spanning tree. So this is a structure on a graph, which is essentially the minimal set of links that will allow you to reach every other thing in the graph, every other node in the graph. So in this case, depending on how the network's set up, perhaps it would be that link would be in, that link would be in, that link might be in, that link might be in, and that link might be in. So these two links, in that case, would not be in the spanning tree. So there's a protocol that runs in the background that maintains that. So if one of these selected links, say this one, were to, were to go down, you'd end up with maybe this one would come in. So it sort of responds to things like that. But all the switches are running that protocol continuously in the background. And they're all kind of, in some sense, they're almost running it independently in that they're all doing their own thing and participating in this protocol. With a software-defined networking, firstly, on each of these switches, you now have a piece of software running, which is able to control the switch. I'll come back to what exactly it does in a minute. And then you have another piece of software, which is called a controller. And this piece of software, the controller, makes a connection to each of these bits of software on each of these switches. There's obviously a bootstrap problem here about how it gets to make that connection, given it's about to control the network. So that's a process that has to be gone through. But basically, you end up with a controller able to talk to each of these switches. And then it talks a protocol called OpenFlow. This is the kind of big hyped one. There are actually two or three other alternatives to this. P4 and POF are two of them. Um, but this is the one that seems to have got out there in the industry and is actually supported by switch manufacturers to some extent. And essentially, it can insert into each of the switches rules that say when you see a packet coming in that matches this, each rule has got basically a match uh, clause and then it's got an action associated with it. And so it might be that a match says, well, if the source IP address equals 10.0.0.1, then we want to drop it. Or it might be that it says, you know, destination IP address equals 10.0.0.2. We want to forward it out of port number three. So it's more explicitly saying to each of the switches, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, this is what you should do in these particular cases. Um, and so it then becomes about explicitly managing those rules. And because this is a piece of software here, you can write uh, whatever sort of algorithms you want here to do things in different ways or to treat traffic in different ways. Each of these bits of software running on the switches, the, the OpenFlow switch, might have a default rule that says, if I see a packet and I don't know what to do with it, I should send it to the controller. So it can then send the packets it's never seen before to the controller. The controller can look at the packet and go, oh, this is somebody trying to make a connection to that web server. I should put in a rule that says, the, make sure that that connection always goes through the firewall or make sure that that connection always goes through some other proxy middle box of some kind. What's the main benefit of using um, this over a more traditional method? Then? It gives you more explicit control. So with these kind of methods, either with this sort of protocol or with the IP routing protocols, you essentially control everything by setting weights and then you allow the network to work things out, is one way to think of it. In this case, you control things by explicitly saying what you want to happen. So you can, and you, you, so you've got that, the ability to be more specific about what should, what should occur. So you can sort of tell what's going to happen, hopefully, more easily. 
in practice with a very complicated network, very complicated rule sets, it might not be so simple. But that's the kind of, the, I think, part of the motivation behind it. Spanning tree, for example, it's essentially drop or forward out of a particular port. In IP routing, it's drop or forward out of a port, and you do a couple of things in passing. So you decrement the TTL field, for example. Um, you might check a checksum and drop it if it doesn't match a checksum, but it, it's still fairly simplistic. With the controller, actions aren't just drop and forward or forward to controller. You can also rewrite certain fields, for example. So you might say, well, packet comes through here with these details in the, in the header. I'm going to rewrite some of those fields before I send it on. Um, you've got more complex rule sets, so you can, with certainly with more recent versions of the OpenFlow protocol, um, you can start to chain tables together. So you can say, well, here is a table of rules, and then if it matches this rule, it's going to go and be processed by this table of rules. And you can build up state as you move the packet between tables. So as you, as you traverse through a sequence of tables, you can remember things about how you got there, essentially. Statistics, for example, about how many packets matched against which of these rules, how many packets, how many bytes matched against which of these rules. And so you're getting this kind of sort of feed of information from it. Who exactly would be running these sort of controls? Is this ISPs or who is So it's an interesting question. There's a lot of research interest in these kind of systems. And actually they go back to or at least to the 1990s. There was work, for example, uh, back in the late 90s, just at the, around the time I started my PhD. So it was done here in Cambridge, uh, which was looking at how to do this kind of control system for an ATM network, so an asynchronous transfer mode, not cash machines. Um, so, but it was a very similar thing where you'd have, you have some kind of layer of software on each switch. You have the ability for some sort of control process to put information into, the, into that software to say what should happen when cells came in on particular virtual circuits. That general idea has been, it's kind of, been around for a bit. Um, and there's a lot of interest in the research community that's kind of waxed and waned over the years. Probably the biggest deployment that I know of that is using this in some sense is Google. So for Google's network, they use that apparently to manage their global uh, network to, to make it work in the way they want it to more efficiently uh, than they can achieve using the traditional kind of protocols. So this, this video could be being streamed by software um, I guess it's, yeah, it's not unlikely. I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert on Google's infrastructure, but it seems not unlikely that that's what would be happening. And it's counting up to 301 views because <laughs> yeah. of... <laughs> Hopefully, at least 301. <laughs> We'd like to thank Audible.com for supporting Computerfile. If you go to audible.com slash Computerfile, you can sign up for a 30-day free trial. Now, today I'd like to recommend a Game of Thrones. Everyone's been talking about the TV series, but the books are absolutely fantastic. And what's better is the graphics are all up here. So that makes them quite a lot better than TV CGI, in my humble opinion. I've inhaled the books and I'm waiting with bated breath for the next one. I'm surprised I haven't actually recommended these before as I've just worked my way through them and just loved every second of it. So remember, audible.com slash Computerfile for that 30-day free trial. Thanks once again to them for supporting Computerfile. The problem is that if I obtain a cookie off you, which is supposed to be secure, then I can send that to, let's say, Amazon or to a shop and say, I'm Sean, please, you know, what's in his shopping basket? What's his address? What's his credit card details? 